الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا فعلمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم My dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So this is class number two in the Ha'i of Ibn Abi Dawood and as I mentioned this is going to be the second foundational class meaning that it's going to be a, a bit of a heavy class but if you understand this class and the previous class then inshallah the rest of the classes will be quite easy to understand Tonight's section is going to be about an introduction to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as an, a specific attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is the attribute of speech. Now the reason why the author started off with the attribute of speech is because as we mentioned the major fitna of his time was the uh, Abbasid Khalifa testing the people was the Quran created or not? And this is where the famous story of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah comes into play. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah was very firm in his position in defending the stance of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah in saying that the, the, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, was not created. So let us start off with the verses. Munib, you want to read for us, inshallah? <laughs> وقل غير مخلوق كلام مليكنا بذلك دان الأتقياء وأفصح ولا تك في القرآن بالوقف قائلا كما قال أتباع للجهم وأسجح ولا تقل القرآن خلق قرأته فإن كلام الله باللفظ يضح Fantastic, stop over there. Can you read the translation as well? Yes. And say, not a created thing is a speech of our great king such was the religious position of the pious ones before us, which they clearly expressed. And do not be a person who takes no position on the Qur'an, as did the followers of Jahm, and they did, they had been too lax to take the right position. And do not say that the Qur'an is created, meaning its recitation, since the speech of Allah through its recitation is made clear. Fantastic. So first let us discuss the role of the Qur'an in the life of the Muslim and why the Qur'an specifically is so important. In Surah Fatiha, you know, at least 17 times a day, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, اِهْدِنَ السَّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ That, oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. Now, this concept of hidayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses it very soon at the, you know, right at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Qur'an as hudan lil muttaqin, that the Qur'an is a guide for those people with taqwa. Now, I want, to understand, well, I want us to understand this point over here. I want you to imagine that you're walking in the absolute darkness. An individual, let's just say you're in the building and the lights go out and you have no idea where to go. And then all of a sudden you see a little path on the floor telling you where the exit is. The Quran is the exact example of that. In Surah Al-An'am verse 122, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gives us an example. He says, take the example of the one who is dead and the one who is living. And as for the one who is living, we have given him a light with which he guides himself and he guides other people. As for the dead, not only is he dead, but he has no light. He cannot guide himself, nor can he guide other people with it as well. Imam al he narrates from some of the predecessors, he said this life and this guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to is the Quran, is the Quran. Other interpretations were it was Iman, other interpretations was this was guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one of the interpretations was that it was the Qur'an. So it shows that when the Qur'an is present, it brings life to people, it brings life to the community. What type of life are we talking about? The first type of life we're talking about is spiritual life, right? When we talk about spirituality, it's very important to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created our, uh, our, our spirits, right? He created our spirits. And the way we become spiritual is by reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our bodies, and the way our bodies are nursed are from the things that come out of the ground which we were created from, then our spirit, while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it, the nourishment of the soul comes with reconnecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and there's no way to better reconnect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than to understand his very speech and to read his speech on a regular basis. So the first thing we need to understand is that the Quran, it gives spiritual guidance. So anytime a person is feeling down, he should recite the Quran, he should listen to the Quran, he should implement the Quran, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lift up his spirits. This is actually, if you look inside Hassan al-Muslim, there's a dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say in times of sorrow and in times of anxiety, right? And in that dua, he used to say, وَجْعَلَ الْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمِ رَبِيعَ قَلْبِ That, oh Allah, make the Qur'an the spring of my heart. Meaning that the, 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 the foundation of life, make that the Qur'an. And he used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, make me from your people and your exclusive ones that you know, recite and live by the Qur'an. This is the dua that the Prophet ﷺ used to make. So it gives spiritual life. A second type of life that the Qur'an gives is moral life. You know, how do you live morally? The Qur'an is there to tell us that. And now if you look at, you know, the times that we live in, subhanAllah, and I'll, I'll share a reflection with you today. For those of you that don't know, you know, yesterday, three Muslims were killed in, in North Carolina. And they were killed not just by being murdered, but they were killed execution style. Literally, they were executed in the middle uh, of the street. Now, this individual, he was, you know, uh, a staunch atheist. He hated any form of religion, particularly anything to do with Islam. And he executed these three people. Now, you would think, you know what? People would condemn this individual. What a terrible and despicable thing he did. And, you know, it's horrendous what he did. This is what the human reaction would be. But if you look at Facebook, subhanAllah, people have created a, a fan page for this individual, saying that he sacrificed his own freedom to grant freedom to other Americans. And this is how like morally bankrupt our world has become, subhanAllah. Where killing people has, been has become considered an act of freedom, has been considered an act of virtue with which we praise people for, subhanAllah. So when we talk about moral life, you know, mankind deludes himself and deceives himself into thinking that we can be moral beings without guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this whole concept of we can dictate and decide what is morally good and what is morally bankrupt, it's not possible. Because everyone will have a different opinion as to what is good and what is bad. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sent down the Qur'an as a form of moral guidance to tell us what is good and to tell us what is bad. A third type of life that the Qur'an brings us is a physical life. Right, so we've mentioned spiritual, we've mentioned um, moral, and now we talk about physical. One of the objectives of the Qur'an being revealed is that the Qur'an, it gives a physical healing to us. Now this is not, you know, some sort of like hocus pocus or anything like that. You know, I even have an example of this right now, subhanAllah. The printer in my office, it's been struggling for like the last two months. Literally, if I want to print something, I have to try like 20 times. <laughs> open the tray, close the tray, open the tray, close the tray. And I wanted to print my notes for the class. And out of the 20 pages, alhamdulillah, I was able to salvage four pages, alhamdulillah. But as it was struggling, I was like, Bismillah, la yadurru ma'asmihi shayun fil ardi wa la fis sama. And Allahu Akbar started printing. I got four pages. I didn't have time to do more adhkar. I'm sure more you know, things would have printed after that. But this shows us the concept of healing by the Quran and by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a very real concept. And that is why when a Muslim gets sick, his primary reaction should not be, oh my God, you know, let me run to the hospital. I mean, unless you've been like stabbed or shot, you know, that's a different thing. But an individual that, you know, he has a headache, he has a fever or something of that nature, he should start by the recitation of the Quran. Recite Surah Fatiha, recite Ayatul Kursi, recite the last three quotes, recite whatever you know from the Quran and use it as a healing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called the Qur'an as a shifa lima fi sudur. It is a cure for that which is in the chests of men. It is a cure for that which is in the chests of men. Number four, the fourth type of life that the Qur'an gives is the life to differentiate between Iman and Kufr. It is the Furqan, right? It is the life between Iman and Kufr. And you can become more specific that it is the life of eternal bliss or, or bliss, which is Jannah, and the life of eternal damnation, which is the hellfire. And an individual that abandons the Quran, this is what is feared for him, that he will end up in the life of eternal damnation. Whereas a person that lives by the Quran and abides by the Quran and recites the Quran, then his place will be in paradise. 
And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells us that those people that memorize the Quran, on the, uh, when they enter into paradise, they will be taught, Iqra wa rattil kama kunta turattilu fi dunya. Recite and read just like you used to recite and read in the dunya. Now who knows what happens at that point? When Allah commands them to read and recite, what happens to them at that point? Who knows? Go ahead. Exactly. For as much Quran as they knew, their levels in paradise increase. For as much Quran as they knew, their levels in paradise will increase. So not only will, you know, is your entrance into Jannah contingent upon believing in the Quran and acting by the Quran, but in fact, the levels that you attain are contingent upon how much of the Quran you recited and you used to frequently recite. And this is why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, you know, subhanAllah, it seems very, very far-fetched. But he says the Muslim should have a relationship with the Qur'an that he recites five juz of the Qur'an every day. That is how much the Muslim should recite. This is not a half of the Qur'an, this is not you know, someone who wants to excel in Qur'anic studies, but the average person should recite five, Quran, uh, five ajza of the Qur'an a day. Now that's, you know, in our times that's impossible, that's, I mean I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's almost impossible. Like where do we find people that recite five uh, ajza of the Qur'an a day? Even the Hafad amongst themselves, if you find someone that recites one juz, two juz, three juz, and that is a big achievement. But to recite five juz a day, you know, subhanAllah, it's a struggle. But he's saying that is what the ideal relationship with the Qur'an should look like. That every six days, you're finishing a recitation of the Qur'an. And if not every six days, then every week. If not every week, then every 10 days. If not every 10 days, then every two weeks. If not every two weeks, every month. But subhanAllah, in our day and age, if you finish the Quran you know, once in a lifetime, we throw you a huge party. We'll throw you an Amin party. You know, that's it. You, you finish the Quran once, you know, your, your life achievement is fulfilled. You'll open the Quran sometimes in the Ramadan and then life goes on. And this is from the deception of Shaitan, subhanAllah. Because Shaitan knows how powerful the Qur'an is. That when the Qur'an is being recited, shaitan has, has no value, his presence, he can't even enter upon the people. But when the people abandon the Qur'an, that is when shaitan can easily come in and misguide the people and misdirect the people. So this is why it's important to understand the role of the Qur'an as a Muslim. And when we talk about the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kalam of Allah that we're referring to, Primarily is the Quran, and then it is all of the other books that were, were revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can tell me the other books revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are mentioned in the Quran? Other scriptures revealed by Allah mentioned in the Quran. Come on, we learned this in Sunday school, like when you're five. Can you tell me one book that was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala besides the Quran? Ibrahim, go ahead. The Torah, who was that revealed to? Fantastic. So the Torah was revealed to Musa alayhi salam. What was revealed to Isa? Come on guys. The Injil. Fantastic. Now we're alive. Alhamdulillah. Was there anything else revealed? Was Dawood given anything? Dawood alayhi salam was given the Zubur. Fantastic. Are we missing anything else? What was he given? He was given scrolls and scriptures. He was given scrolls and scriptures. The Suhaf of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So these are the revelations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. These are the revelations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. Now, why this is going to become a technical issue? If you say that the Quran is created, right? What is the value of the Quran? It becomes absolutely nothing. The Quran will be equivalent to this tablecloth, to this microphone, to the floor that we walk on when you say that the Qur'an is created. But when you say that the Qur'an is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it actually has value. Then it actually has value, right? Because this is being directly attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anything that is attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then by default it, it is valuable, right? Because it's yani Rabbul Alameen that, uh, you know, this is, is his thing. This is his thing. So now let us actually get into the poetry. He goes on to say, وَقُلْ غَيْرُ مَخْلُوقٍ كَلَامُ مَلِكِنَا And say that the, the, the speech of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is not created. Now, let us understand where the deviant sects are coming from. Let us understand where the deviant sects are coming from. So, the verse in the Quran in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke a speech to Musa alayhi salam. 
In the story of Musa, this speech was when Musa alayhi salam was climbing up the mountain and he was speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Mu'tazila over here, if you look into their books of tafsir, they said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a speech which he placed inside the bush and it was the bush that spoke to Musa alayhi salam. This is the bush that spoke to Musa alayhi salam. Now why would the Mu'tazila have to go, you know, go so far from what is apparent? Remember I said the position of Ahlul Sunnah is that we understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah on their apparent meaning. When Allah says, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala apparently, directly spoke to Musa alayhi salam. There isn't mention of intermediaries, there isn't any mention of a bush, there isn't mention of any creation. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا now why did the Mu'tazila go this far in denying and rejecting the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They said that if you were to affirm the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you would affirm that there is something just as ancient as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as quote unquote old as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you cannot have two things that are ancient. Now understand the meaning of ancient with them. The meaning of ancient with them is something that has no beginning, something that has no beginning. So if you have something that has no beginning, then this becomes an ilah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is not possible, and this is not possible. So that is the, 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 the thought process that they had, that anything that is ancient, existed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that becomes another ilah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is something that we cannot have, so therefore it must be rejected. Therefore, it must be rejected. Now where did they get this far-fetched philosophy from? As we mentioned last week, Greek philosophy creeped into the Aqidah of the Muslims and this is where it came from. That instead of you know, you know, using the Qur'an and the Sunnah for their epistemology as their sources of knowledge of Aqidah, the Mu'tazila, they went to Greek philosophy. And they said we will understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our own rationale. And this will lead to even you know, denying some of the verses of the Qur'an or clearly misinterpreting them. Clearly misinterpreting them. Now, let us move on to the Aqidah of the Ashaira, the Aqidah of the Ashaira and the Matrudiyah. So the first thing we want to understand is, we mentioned last week that the Ashaira, they came as a stance between Ahl Sunnah and the Mu'tazila, right? They came as a stance between Ahl Sunnah and the Mu'tazila. Now this may seem like it's a middle position, but it's not the balanced, praiseworthy middle position that we refer to. It is a balanced position between Ahl Sunnah and the Mu'tazila, meaning that they're better than the Mu'tazila to a certain degree, but they still have a severe flaw. Now let us understand what were the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they actually affirmed. The Mu'tazila, the only affirm, sorry, the Ashaira, they only affirmed seven of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They affirmed seven of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they called these the attributes of necessity. Meaning that these, abs uh, these attributes are an absolute necessity that they cannot be denied. Because they're, they're, they are required for a Lord to have them. They are required for a Lord to have them. So let's go through those seven. They say he is Al-Hay, Al-Alim, Al-Qadir, Wal-Kalamu Lahu. وَكَذَلِكَ الْعِلْمُ وَكَذَلِكَ السَّمْعُ وَالْبَصَرُ I'm missing one in the middle, but we'll get to it inshallah. So they've mentioned, the first thing they mentioned for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He is Al-Hay, that He is the ever-living. So they affirm life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously you cannot have a, a, an ilah that is not alive. So this is the first attribute of necessity. The second attribute of necessity, هُوَ الْحَيُّ الْعَلِيمُ Right, that He is the one that is the all-knowledgeable. That you can't have an ilah that is ignorant, you can't have an ilah that knows nothing at all. So this was the second attribute of necessity. Al-Qadir, that he is the one that has capability, that he has the ability to, to create, the ability to move, the ability to change, Walikum <laughs> the, uh, the ability to change his creation, the ability to rotate uh, the, the planets and the, the, the sun and the moon and the orbits and all of those things. That was the third thing. The fourth attribute they affirmed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَالْكَلَامُ lahu That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has kalam, He has speech, right? Now why would the, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the ilah, need speech? Who can tell me that? According to them, why was speech a necessity? Why does an ilah, why does God Himself actually need speech? At that time, 
You're like a quarter of the way there. There's another 75% to go. The idols couldn't speak, so what did that mean about the idols? They couldn't communicate. Why is communicate important, uh, important for, for an ilah? To guide the people, right? So for them, an ilah that could not speak, he could not guide the people. And that is why they necessitated that that the ilah must have some form of kalam. Whether it be a written kalam, written speech, or oral speech, or whatever type of speech, he needs to have some sort of kalam, because this is what is needed to guide the people, in terms of giving them commands, giving them prohibitions, giving them information, right? This can only take place through kalam. Number five, they, affiliate, they affirmed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-irada. They affirmed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the will to do something. Now the will, according to them, subhanAllah, is almost as if it is a, a lack of will, from the, the aspect of the creation. Because the, while they affirmed the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they said that mankind was compelled by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that you know, goes into the chapter of Qadr, which we'll study later on in the book inshallah. But just understand that they affirmed irada for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That nothing can happen except by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is another one by necessity. An ilah that has no will, how will he you know, control the creation and will things and not will things? That's number five. Number six, as sama that he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears. Hearing is important because he needs to be able to hear what his creation is saying to him, right? One of the objectives of the ilah is to answer the supplications of the ones that are supplicating to him. If he cannot hear them, he cannot respond to them. And then the last one, al-basr, which is not just sight, but sight with insight, right? Basira is not just mere sight, but it is to have the ability to foretell and to see and you know, much more than that. So here they affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sight as well, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to be able to see His creation, to see what they are doing. Now what did they do with all of the other attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So when it came to the attribute of mercy, you'll notice that there's no mercy over here. According to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need to be merciful indefinitely, right? But they said the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is affiliated with his qudra and his irada, right? So the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is affiliated to when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to do something and his ability. How about the aspect of love? How about the aspect of generosity? How about the aspect of, you know, the descent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the rising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? All of these things they denied for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they said they, these are not a necessity. These are not a necessity. So these are the seven attributes that they affirmed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now from these seven attributes that they affirmed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what they did with the other attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of two things. One of two things. Either they did something called ta'wil, or they did something called tafwith. Either they did ta'wil, or they did tafwith. Ta'wil is to interpret something on a meaning that is not apparent. On a meaning that is not apparent. So to interpret the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as His power, or His blessings. Right? That is what they interpreted it as. They interpreted the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as His power, or His blessings. This is a, when you hear the, the word hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? You don't necessarily think about the, 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 the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power, right? But you would naturally understand the word hand from it because that is the apparent meaning of the term yad in the Arabic language. Likewise, you know, with the, actually, well, let's just take the example of the yad. That is a, a clear example over there. So that is what they did with ta'wil. What does tafwid mean? Tafwid, this means that we do not understand what the Qur'an means at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word yad, attributing it to himself, but we don't understand what this means. For all we know, it could mean the skies, it could mean the earth, it could mean anything. We give all knowledge purely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this would seem like a safe position, right? This seems like a very safe position, that Allah mentions something in the Qur'an, what does this word mean? We say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But is that a position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to have? And the answer is no. Who can tell me why? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not want us to make tafweeth of the Qur'an? We discussed this last week. 
you don't uh, understand like that, that, where is the guidance? That's the obvious, you know, statement that if we can't understand the Quran, how are you meant to be guided from this? But we mentioned a clear example last week. Go ahead. Right. Do you remember the verse we used? I think it was Yusuf. That we have revealed the Quran in the Arabic language So that you may reflect and understand and ponder So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us why he revealed the Quran in Arabic So that it may be understood So now to say that we're going to take this position Which is safe and we're not going to you know, give these words any meaning it is counterintuitive to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually commanding us with in the Qur'an that we should reflect and ponder and try to understand the Qur'an. And if it was not possible to understand the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have commanded us with this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have commanded us with this. So now let us specifically understand how the Ashaira understood the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How did the Ashaira understand the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So I'm just going to read something out for you. It goes, وَهُمْ أَتْبَعَ مُحَمَّدِ بْنُ سَعِيدِ بْنُ كُلَابِ وَهُوَ أَحَدُ الْمُتَكَلِّمِينَ الْمُتَسْبِينَ لِلْسُنَّةِ وَكَانَ يُرُدُّ عَلَى الْمُعْتَزِلَةِ وَعَلَى مَنْهَجِهِ دَرَجَ أَبُو الْحَسَنَ الْأَشْعَرِ وَهَوْلَاءِ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ مَعْنَا قَائِمٌ بِذَاتِهِ لَيْسَ بِحَرْفٍ وَلَا صوت وإنه قديم لا تتعلق بمشيئته. So let us break down what the Ashara actually believe. So they say that the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a meaning that is only internally held by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a meaning, meaning that there's no words, there's no sounds, but it is a, only a meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala internally held within, him, within of Himself. Um, let me just actually further explain that. So how did the Quran come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if it is only a meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala held internally inside Himself? They said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took this meaning and placed it inside Jibreel. And then Jibreel conveyed it to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they are not the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it is a meaning, but the words are either of the words of Muhammad or the words of Jibreel. So these aren't the words that we recite in the Quran, they aren't the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, these are just the meanings of the words that was given. Laysa biharfin wala sawt. That it has no letters, nor does it have any sound to it. Nor does it have any sound to it. Now, Again, going back to this you know, far-fetched reality that the, the people of innovation have to create for themselves, you see it over here, right? The Mu'tazila did, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly spoke to Musa alayhi salam, why do we have to have this far-fetched reality? Now, let us take a clear example of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is narrated by Imam al-Bukhari. There's a beautiful story that Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah mentions in Kitab al-Ilm. And this is the importance of traveling for the sake of knowledge. And this is the story of Jabir radiallahu anhu, who traveled for the journey of one month, subhanAllah, to hear one hadith from another sahabi by the name of Abdullah ibn Unais. Abdullah ibn Unais radiallahu anhu ajma'in. He traveled for one month to hear this hadith. What was the hadith? That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said that on the day of judgment, people will come in their original states, hufat and aratan, without any shoes, in their original states, uncircumcised. In the complete version of this hadith, which is mentioned in, in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad by Imam Al-Bukhari, there's a very interesting point over here. That he says that on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, and Al-Malik and Al-Dayyan. So it's the same narration, but he adds, and Al-Malik and Al-Dayyan. That I am the king, and I am the one who will, you know, hold people accountable to pay their debts. Dayyan is the one who holds people accountable to pay their debts. Right? Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he goes on to say, يَسْمَعُهُ مَنْ بُعِدْ that the one who is far will hear him just like the one who is close. Just like the one who is close. So this clearly affirms for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a speech which is real. It has a, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a speech which is real. And at the same time it affirms for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a speech that is not like the speech of the creation. And this is going to be one of the principles of Ahlul Sunnah. That we affirm the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that is befitting His Majesty. So for us, if we were to shout from on top of a mountain, the ones that are close to us, they will be able to hear us. But someone that is like a thousand kilometers away or a thousand miles away, they won't be able to hear us. And the further you get, the less you'll actually be able to hear. 
But here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the one who is far from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is going to be, he's going to hear Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala just like the one who is near, just like the one who is near. So that's from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the Quran itself, in the Quran itself, in Surah At-Tawbah, verse number six. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, when istajaraka ahadun min al mushrikeen fa'ajirhu hatta yasma' kalam Allah. That if any of the mushrikeen seek protection from you, give them protection. Why? So that they may hear the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He affirms that the Quran is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but more importantly, that they can hear it. Meaning that it is something that is physically heard. It's not some internal meaning that is transferred, but it is something that is physically heard. Now the last part the, from the, the ashara that they mentioned about the, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَإِنَّهُ قَدِيمٌ لَا تتعلق به, uh, بِهِ So they said that, uh, the, the ashara said that the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that is ancient. It is not something that is dictated by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke at one time everything He wanted to say, and that is what exists. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't speak at particular given times. He does not speak at particular given times. So what He spoke to Musa, what He spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, what He spoke to Ibrahim, this was all one speech, right? He spoke at one time, and that's what it was. And there was no, you know, there is no need for relevance or, or you know, uh, context for, at a given time where he had to speak, but he spoke that one time and that was it. So now we've taken the path of the Mu'tazila and we've taken the path of the Ashaira. Let us now understand what Ahlul Sunnah said, right? And this is what I wanted to introduce you to, uh, a simple principle in philosophy, which is what they call Occam's Razor. Does anyone know what Occam's Razor is? Occam's Razor. Anyone know? Go ahead. Fantastic. That the simplest answer is more than likely the correct answer. And we need to understand this principle when it comes to our faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed the Qur'an not just for the greatest theologian and philosopher, but He revealed it for the Bedouin that did not know how to read and write and herds his camels. Right? So the Qur'an is revealed for all you know, segments of society, the educated and the uneducated. What does that necessitate? What that necessitates is that the Qur'an is in such a simple language that whether you are an absolute layman that knows nothing, he can extract something from the Qur'an and understand something from the Qur'an, or you're the greatest, most educated academic in the world, then you can also extrapolate something from the Qur'an as well. So that is the general principle that we uh, you know, use when it comes to understanding the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep it as simple as possible. Simple in understanding, simple in implementation. That is what we are striving for. That is what we are striving for. Now in order to understand you know, the position of Ahl sunnah then we need to understand uh, a group of principles. We need to understand a group of principles. And this is being quoted from uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah's Aqidat al-Wasatiyah, Aqidat al-Wasatiyah. You don't need to write down everything, but try to grab as much as you can, particularly the four main points that he mentions. He goes on to say, and the way of the Salaf of this Ummah and its Imams is that they describe Allah with that which He Himself describes. So that's point number one, is that we affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms for Himself. Number two, that which his messenger described him with. That which his descri messenger described him with. Number three, without any tahrif and without any ta'til. So just write those words down and we'll explain what they mean. Without any tahrif and without any ta'til. That's number three. Number four, without any takif nor any tamthil. Without any takif nor any tamthil. That's number four. Okay, so these are the four principles that Ahl Sunnah use as a very general guideline to affirm the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the proof for this understanding? What is the proof for this understanding? It is the verse in Surah Al Shura, verse number 11. Surah number 42, verse number 11. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ That there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He is the all here and the all seer. So let us understand what this verse is actually telling us. So number one, the first thing that it is telling us 
is that there's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at the creation, when you look at how far your imagination can go with all of its creativity, even then you will not be fully able to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our comprehension, is beyond our understanding, is beyond our imagination, is beyond what we physically see, right? So that's what the first part of the ayah is saying. The second part of the ayah is saying, وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ That He is the one that he is the all-hearing and the all-knowing. Now why are these two attributes important? Who can tell me why these two attributes are important over here? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mention these two attributes over here? Or these two names over here? Who else has been described with these two names and attributes? Human Where? Okay, give me the ayah. Skip my mind. Skip your mind? Yeah. Okay, I'll accept your answer anyways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He described human beings with the exact same attributes of being Samir and Basir. And this is not just one place in the Quran, in fact, many places in the Quran. Right? You will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes human beings with the exact same attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is described with as well. So, you know, he describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Rahim wa kana bil mu'minin rahima and he describes himself as Rahim. So this shows us that while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot truly be comprehended, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still has attributes that we also possess, but in a manner that is befitting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. In a manner that is befitting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this is one of the principles that Ibn Taymiyyah mentions over uh, in Tadmuriyah. He says, Al-Kalamu fi sifat kal-Kalamu fi that That the way we understand the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the exact same way we understand the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like we do not say our life is like the life of Allah, or sorry, rather the life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like our life, then similarly, Allah's hearing is not like our hearing. Yet we still affirm them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Other groups, they could not understand the simple concept that how is it possible for the creation and the creator to have the exact same attributes, right? The, those attributes must be created if the creation has them. What they failed to understood is just like they, they accepted the life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the life of human beings, then similarly the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the exact same way. We affirm them for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we say that they're in a way that is completely befitting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a way that is completely befitting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was you know, the, the understanding of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah from this one verse that he established those principles. Now the first and the second, this is what we were talking about last week, that when it comes to sources of aqidah, our primary sources of aqidah are Quran and Sunnah. It's not our intellect, it's not our rationale, right? It is purely what the Quran and Sunnah say. So that is the first two principles of Ibn Taymiyyah. And then he goes on to talk about the four mistakes that the groups made when it came to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing he mentions is tahrif and ta'til. Tahrif. Tahrif is to misinterpret something. It is to misinterpret something. So it is as if Allah tells you something else and then you change the meaning to something else. This is what tahrif is. And this is, um, so actually, do you guys understand that concept? Tahrif is that you, you, Allah says something, but you distort that meaning to something else. So ta'wil and tahrif are very similar in that, in that, in that sense. So ta'wil is something that it is a plausible, a plausible other meaning. And tahrif is that it's not even a plausible other meaning. You just came out of, you came out with this meaning without, well, sorry, without you know, any proof or, or any backing to it whatsoever. So that is what tahrif is. It is to distort the meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended. Then number two, he mentions a ta'til. And a ta'til is to completely deny it. To completely reject it whatsoever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he has rahmah. And then human beings say, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no rahmah. Right? It is ta'til, to completely deny and absolve that meaning whatsoever. So that was the third thing that Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned. And then the fourth thing is a takif wa tamthil. Takif is the howness, right? How is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like this? This is not a question that Ahlul Sunnah asks. We do not ask about howness and we don't ponder howness, nor do we just try to describe the howness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And then a tamthil 
This can also be called tashbih. This can also be called tashbih. And what this is saying is, you're trying to extract a parable or an example of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His creation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is similar to His creation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is similar to His creation. That is what tamthil and tashbih is. Okay? So these are the four words that Ibn Taymiyyah uses. Now let us take an example of one of the predecessors and how they understood the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the clearest examples of the understanding of the predecessors when it came to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the story of Imam Malik rahimahullah. The story of Imam Malik and it's narrated by Ad-Darimi in his Musnad. The story of Imam Malik rahimahullah is a man came to him and he said, كَيْفَ istiwa? How is the ascension of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So you'll notice in seven places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term istiwa. Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istiwa. You'll find this about seven times in the Quran. So he asked him, كيف istiwa? How is the ascension of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay? Imam Malik rahimahullah, he got very upset at that time. He got very upset at that time. According to Ahl sunnah the reason why Imam, uh, Imam Malik got upset was because such questions are not befitting to be asked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We don't ask about the howness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't ask about why about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah says, we accept it. According to Ahl sunnah this is why uh, Imam Malik rahimahullah got accept, uh, upset. According to the other groups, the deviant groups, they said that Imam Malik rahimahullah, he got upset over here because someone affirmed the istiwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or that, you know, he's asking a question of aqidah. You know, how dare this man ask a question. And that's how they understood this scenario over here. Now, that, that segment is actually irrelevant, but I just wanted you to understand about that, that, that point. Now, how did Imam Malik rahimahullah respond to this? He says, al-istiwa'un ma'loom. That is this concept of istiwa, is something that we have absolute certain knowledge about, right? So when you say something is ma'loom, it means that it is known, it is understood, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this exact same word in the Qur'an. Like I said, about seven times in the Qur'an, you will find the istiwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma'loom also means that not only did Allah mention it, but we have knowledge of it. So is it possible to have knowledge of something yet not understand it? And the answer to that is no. If you have knowledge of something, you actually understand what you know. That is what ilm means. You have certain knowledge and certain understanding about it. So to say that we can make tafwid over here, Imam Malik is refuting tafwid over here by saying that istiwa is known. Right? The second thing he goes on to say, wal kayfu majhul, that or al kayfu gairu ma'kul, and in both of those narrations are there that the howness of this. This is something that is unknown, nor is it comprehensible. This is unknown, nor is it compre comprehensible. Wal iman bihi wajib. And the third thing he mentions, an iman in this is wajib. Iman in this is uh, mandatory and compulsory. It's mandatory and compulsory because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself affirmed this for himself. Right? Wasu'alu anhu bid'ah. And to ask about it. Right? To ask كيف الاستواء, to ask about the istiwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is an innovation. This is an innovation. And at that time, Imam Malik rahimahullah kicked him out of the class, kicked him out of that gathering. So who can tell me now what are the four things that Imam Malik mentioned about the istiwa? What are the four things that Imam Malik mentioned? Go ahead. Yeah. He said uh, the istiwa is ma'lum, it is known. It is known, fantastic. And we can understand and we know it. Right. And the iman is wajib. Okay, you've jumped the gun, that's number three. So he said uh, it's not ma'lum, um, and he said it's the howness is ununderstandable and unknowing. Fantastic. Unknown. Yep. Number three, he said the iman on it is wajib. Fantastic. And number four, the questioning it is bid'ah. Fantastic. So these are simple principles that we see Imam Malik rahimahullah had to understand the attributes, uh, and the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we're going to take some further principles as well, and then we'll conclude insha'Allah ta'ala. In terms of uh, further principles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one is that anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is described with has to be good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never described with evil. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the most beautiful and complete and perfect names, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of His names, all of His attributes are beautiful. 
So there are certain things that are said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran that even though Allah is described with them, they're not affirmed as an attribute for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So things like makar, right? Makar is to plan and to plot. And this is like an evil type of planning and plotting. Wa makaru wa makaru Allah, wallahu khayrul makirin. That they planned and plotted, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans and plots, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of all planners and plotters. Now does that mean that we derive a name of Allah or an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is makir? No, we say that this is not the case. Because makar within of itself does not have a positive connotation. In fact, it is something negative. However, it becomes a positive connotation when it's done in reaction to someone else's plotting. When it's done in reaction to someone else's plotting. Right? So in this situation, that is when it becomes positive in its complete context. Isolated by itself, it is not positive. So everything that is mentioned about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is meant to be perfect and good. A second principle about the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that everything has a meaning behind it. Everything has a meaning behind it. What does that actually mean? What that means is we can have someone named Muhammad here, right? And this Muhammad, linguistically, it means he is someone that is praised, right? That is what Muhammad means. But this individual that we're talking about, you know, this XYZ person right over here, no, there's no one actually there, right? This person that we're talking about, his name is Muhammad. But this person steals, he lies, he cheats, he does every sort of sin that you can imagine. Even though he has this name Muhammad, has he lived up to it? Meaning that he's someone that's praiseworthy? No, not at all, right? In fact, he's the exact opposite. He's someone that is worthy of criticism. So he has a name, but he doesn't live up to that name. Whereas with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lives up to that meaning. So when Allah's name is Al-Alim, it means that He in fact has Ilm. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Qadir, it means in fact that He has Qudra. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman, He in fact is the source of mercy, right? So all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names, they have a meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, has a characteristic of. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a characteristic of. A third principle is, that we will negate for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that which He negates for Himself while affirming its opposite. We will negate for, Ahl, uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that which He negates for Himself while affirming its opposite. Do we understand that principle? What does that mean? Let us look to Ayatul Kursi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Allahu la ilaha illa hu al hayyul qayyum la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. Allah, none has the right to be worshipped but He, the ever-living, the self-sustainer and supporter of all, neither some slumber nor sleep overtakes Him. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms for Himself that He is Al-Hayy and Al-Qayyum, right? Al-Hayy meaning the ever-living, the one full of life, and Al-Qayyum, the one that rectifies and the one that sustains, okay? So these are two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that attributes of, uh, are actually, uh, you know, extracted from. The, the attribute of life and the attribute of control and sustainability. So that's what's affirmed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negate for Himself? لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم That sleep nor slumber overtake Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they don't apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He denies that sleep overtakes Him because this would be a deficiency in life. That you're not full of life if you're falling asleep, right? And at the same time, slumber does not overtake Him, meaning that Allah does not become tired and lethargic and, you know, lazy because then that is not someone that sustains all the time, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He denies and rejects two attributes while affirming the exact opposite of it. While affirming the exact opposite of it. Do we understand that? That is what we mean that Ahlul Sunnah, we will reject the exact same things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejected while affirming the exact opposite. While affirming the exact opposite. Let me give you a second example. A second example of this is in Surah Al-Furqan, verse 58. Surah Al-Furqan, verse 58. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says over here, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُوتْ And have your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ever-living that does not die. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejects for himself death while affirming ever life for him. He rejects for himself death while affirming ever life for him. 
So this is the position of Ahlul Sunnah that any time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejects and denies something for himself, then Ahlul Sunnah will reject it and deny it as well while affirming the exact opposite. While affirming the exact opposite. Now, I'll conclude this segment over here by saying that the studying of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in fact the most beautiful science that we know of. Because it is the science that we get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by. And in fact, this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know. He tells us, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That know that He is Allah, the one that there's no one worthy of worship with. So He commands us to have knowledge of this. He also tells us indirectly, by each time when He tells us, you know, all of His names, هُوَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا هُوَ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ الرَّحِيمُ الْمَلِكُ الْقُدُّوسُ السَّلَامُ الْمُؤْمِنُ الْمُحَيْمِنُ الْعَزِيزُ الْجَبَّارُ The ending of Surah Al-Hashr. All those names are mentioned because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know who He is. So this is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the most beneficial of knowledge in terms of increasing your iman, in terms of increasing your spirituality, in terms of increasing your taqwa. And this is something that we'll come to in a second. That this knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dependent upon understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you don't have sound principles in understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will not truly be able to understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Now, if you want to do further reading on this subject, where can you go? Where can you go? And I will advise you with three books, all of them available online for free. I don't want to advertise the website, but I'm pretty sure everyone knows the website. If you don't know it, come to me after the halakha and I'll tell you the website. The first book is called uh, Al-Qawaid Al-Muthla by Shaykh Ibn Uthameen. The, the you know, extraordinary principles pertaining to the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is Al-Qawaid Al-Muthla by Shaykh Ibn Uthameen. Fantastic book talking about the principles that Ahlul Sunnah has of understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two is the principles of Ahlul Sunnah and understanding the names and attributes of Allah. The principles of Ahlul Sunnah and understanding the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is by Shaykh Muhammad Khalifa Tamimi. By Shaykh Muhammad Khalifa Tamimi. Book number three. This is the first book in the Aqidah series of uh, Shaykh uh, Al Ashkar. So, Shaykh Al Ashkar, he wrote, uh, you know, I think seven or eight volumes. Does anyone know for sure? Seven or eight volumes? Munib? Seven. Seven or eight. It's either seven or eight. The first of them is called is the, the book of, of, of Allah. You know, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So that is another book that talks about, you know, how do we get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is in terms of principles. A fourth book that I'm suggesting over here, and this is just for the sake of spirituality, to understand the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the effect that they have in our lives. And this is called Understanding the Names of Allah by Shaykh Abdurrahman ibn Nasir al-Sa'di. By Shaykh Abdurrahman ibn Nasir al-Sa'di. And this one website has all of those books available for free download, inshallah. So you can download those books, read more about it, get to understand the principles of Ahlul Sunnah, because once you have sound principles, you will have a sound understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you have a sound understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, this is what will actually lead you to have taqwa. This is what will actually lead you to have taqwa. Now let's move on to the next two and a half verses in the next five minutes, inshallah. بِذَلِكَ دَانَا الْأَتْقِيَاءُ وَأَفْسَحُ And this is what the righteous people understood and explicitly mentioned. So here, um, the poet, he, say, he describes Ahl sunnah as being atqiya, that they are the people of taqwa. They are the people of taqwa. Why does he describe them as people of taqwa? He describes them as people of taqwa because generally speaking, Ahlul Sunnah are meant to be the most pious and righteous of people. While we don't say you can't be from Ahlul Sunnah while committing a sin, we would definitely say that your Iman is deficient if you're regularly committing sin or, ha or are committing major sins in particular. So the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will lead you to have taqwa. It will lead you to have taqwa. And taqwa, there have been many definitions. But from the, the simplest of them and the best of them, it is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon knowledge and it is to abstain from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon knowledge. That is a general understanding of what taqwa is. And Ibn al-Qayyim and Imam al-Dhahabi, they said, this is from the best of definitions. This is from the definition of uh, Ibn al-Habib, from the definition of Ibn al-Habib. So here he mentions that 
the pious predecessors, they all said, and Imam al he actually quotes 500 people. In Sharh Usul Atiqad Ahl Sunnah, he quotes 500 people that said that the Quran or the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ghayr Makhluk, that it was not created. So they were very explicit about this. The next line he goes on to say, وَلَا فِي الْقُرْآنِ بِالْوَقْفِ قَائِلًا كَمَا قَالَ أَتْبَعُ الْجَحْمِ وَأَسْجَحُ And do not say that we will take this quote-unquote middle position where we say that the Qur'an is created or not created, or we don't take a stance at all, right? This is group was called the, 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 the Waqifiya, that they, they took a stance of not taking a stance, right? And this was from the followers of Jahan ibn Safwan, who said that the Qur'an was created. So this seemed like it was a, a, a middle stance, but in fact the scholars of Aqidah said that the Waqifiya were even worse than the followers of Jahan. Because the followers of Jahan, they made it very explicit what they believed, and they said the Qur'an is created, and this is an evil position. But the Waqafiyya, they said, you know what? We're trying to come as a middle ground. That rather than saying that the Quran is created or not created, we will take that middle ground and say, you know, we're not taking a stance on this issue. But it is very, very clear that the stance of Ahl Sunnah, the stance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger وسلم, and the Sahaba and the Tabi'een that they all have is that the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is not created. Asjahu over here in this uh, line over here. Asjahu means to, to naturally inclined towards something. So the followers of Jaham, they naturally inclined towards this opinion. And what the author is saying over here is that their heart had become so corrupted that it would naturally lean towards, you know, you know bad things. It would naturally lean towards bad things. وَلَا تُقُلِ الْقُرْآنُ خَلْقٌ What's this word over here? That it's recitation and do not say that the recitation of the Qur'an is created, right? That for verily the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through its pronunciation and enunciation becomes clarified. What is this referring to? You'll get a detailed understanding of this, inshallah, in a couple of weeks, I'll be starting the biographies of the Imams of Hadith. That's going to be the Friday night halaqa, inshallah. And this was something that was particular to Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. That he was asked, you know, is our recitation of the Qur'an something that is created or not, right? And then he gave an answer to this, which got him into trouble. And in fact, some of the scholars of Aqidah said that in fact attributing this to Imam al-Bukhari is incorrect altogether. We'll discuss it in the halaqa. But what's important to understand is that people will get trapped into answering questions that could have a double meaning to it, right? So if someone t asks you, is your recitation of the Qur'an created or not? What should you answer to this? The first thing we say is that such questions should not be asked. If you're going to ask a question, be very specific and clear. Speak a straightforward word, not something that has a double meaning. From the principles of Ahl Sunnah is that when there is something that is said that has a double meaning, you always ask for clarification before you answer it. So if there's something that can be misinterpreted and uh, misinterpreted, ask for clarification before you answer that. So now how can this be interpreted in two ways? So the worst first way it can be interpreted is, is the Quran, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created? And the answer to that is no, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not created. It is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, if you're asking me, is the sound of my voice created? Then the answer to that is yes. The sound of my voice is created even when I'm reciting the Qur'an. That sound is a created sound, right? So that aspect of it is created. So when someone says, is your recitation of the Qur'an created or uncreated? Then here we're taught a very important principle. Always ask for clarification before you answer. Before you answer. So do not say that my recitation of the Qur'an is created, but rather you take a, 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 uh, a stance of clarification. We don't say we don't answer that, but we say we seek clarification before we answer. And then here the author he concludes by saying that from the principles of Ahlul Sunnah, and this is something we've spoken about uh, extensively, is that everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it has meaning behind it. That the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-explanatory. It is not something that requires, you know, uh, a philosophy degree and, and Greek philosophy and, you know, everything else to understand it. But rather the kalam of Allah, the speech of Allah is self-explanatory. It explains itself, right? So this is what the, the last verse he concluded with. 
And we will conclude with this as well. Wallahu ta'ala alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And I will take three questions from you guys inshallah. Go ahead. He recited the last, second last one. He said, وَلَا تَقُلِ الْقُرْآنُ خَلْقٌ قِرَاءَتُهُ versus قِرَأْتُهُ It's supposed to be قِرَأَتُهُ Wallahu alam. Okay. Second question is, you mentioned in the beginning of the halaqa the issue of um, what the Asha'ana did the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said yes one of the things that they did was tafweel yes okay um, how do we understand this issue of tafweel with the um, uh, Al Iman the first page that speaks about um, um, yes right. so there is oh. some Rav Duqam which you don't understand anyways Okay, I mean, let's go back to the verse in Surah Al-Imran. Uh, that's the first verse. Right? So these are the two ways that you can recite that ayah. Depending on where you do the waqf over here, you can say that the knowledge of the mutashabihat is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or from Ibn Abbas, he used to recite with continuation that the knowledge of these verses is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, the ulul in, the people of knowledge. So obviously, uh, you know, when you do further study, what does it mean by the, by the, the mutashabihat over here? Right, the, the Ahlul Bid'ah, they said this is referring to the attributes and the Aqidah, we can't understand what it means. But this is not what it's referring to. It's just referring to that there are certain things that their ultimate reality, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know, or those people that have sound knowledge, or those people that have sound knowledge. Right, so to go back to your question, which was how did this tie into this? So, okay, then what does that mean? Give me an example of what, what do, do, what do the mutashabihat mean? Like, so there's certain, so just because something is mutashabih, it doesn't mean it's absolute mutashabih. So, our, our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's an element of it we understand and an element of it which is mutashabih. So, we affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, that He is ever living, He has no beginning and He has no ending. But can our minds truly comprehend something like that? Do we know anything that has no beginning or has no ending? No, because our understanding of this world is that everything has a beginning and ending. So one aspect of it is clear cut, another aspect of it is mutashabih, that the reality is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Any other questions? Khair, we'll conclude with that. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, shahadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.